this is my kind of slightly clickbaity talk title. Um, some of my coworkers helped me work on this. The original talk title was the Open Source Contributor Funnel, which is like the main focus of this talk, but that doesn't sound, it's not so like, you know, 10 awesome th hacks to whatever, like, you know, this is more like BuzzFeed type approach to talking. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm coming to this topic with like kind of two hats on. Um, as mentioned before, thank you, uh, Helen, that I'm a maintainer on Homebrew, uh, and that's like a big part of my, I guess, open source experience, probably the th main thing I work on open source wise in the last like eight years or so. Um, and so people here have kind of, I saw a fair few set of hands for people who use Homebrew. Thank you very much. Um, has anyone here submitted a PR to Homebrew before? Well, hopefully we will get lots of you, lots more of you doing that by the end of the week. Um, and I really appreciate everyone kind of coming along and when it's kind of right after lunch, I hopefully can have a little bit of interactivity. Feel free if there's something that is really confusing that like I say or whatever, just start like waving at me rather than shouting out or anything and I'll try and address your points if they're need addressed while we go along. Anyway, so my second hat that I wear is the, since kind of January, um, I've been focusing on open source at GitHub. I work on our team there where we're trying to basically make GitHub better for open source projects. And I've been working at GitHub as an engineer since 2013. Um, so again, if you want to follow up about anything that I talk about today in relation to either Homebrew or GitHub specifically, then just give me a shout. So the type of projects we're mainly talking about today are ones that are already open sourced and ones that already have like some users who are not the original creator of the project. The, there's gonna be stuff in here that's gonna be relevant if this doesn't apply. Maybe if you're planning on open sourcing a project in the future, maybe if you kind of don't have many users yet, but you're sort of anticipating when you do, that's gonna be relevant, but this is like our main core audience right now. Um, but again, try and like bear with me while I kind of focus on the kind of particular niche I'm going for. So. The main question I think I've heard a bunch of people ask before is why does no one contribute to my project? Like it's out there, it's doing a good job. Like I've kind of got users, people who use it, people seem enthusiastic about it. Like I may be giving talks about it at conferences, but yet like the people using it and the project being kind of maintained well and released well doesn't seem to translate into actually getting people to contribute to the project. And what I'm gonna try and do today is have like a little bit of a like pivot on some of this stuff into thinking about stuff from a similar angle, which is like, let's, let's think about, as we are with open source projects, let's think about like proprietary projects. Like if we were selling something, like why does no one buy my product? So I guess thinking about the stuff we made before, like let's think about our open source project, like why, why is no one buying that? Why is no one like participating in the community we've built? Because again, that's what we're doing. We're kind of making two things when we make open source projects. We're making like, software code that people use and we're also making a community that we want people to kind of partake in and a community that we want to kind of grow so that that software becomes better so it's not just the product of one person or one group of people or whatever who initially started working on it so if you had a product that people aren't buying then this might be your problem this might be your checkboxes so we've already created this product like i use it myself i've kind of given some of this widgets to my friends and family and they're using it and they all really like it but like no one's coming up to buy this stuff again some of you may have friends who've made startups who have kind of fallen into the same thing where you know they go and work on something in a room for a while then they release it and find that crickets respond so i guess the the points there i'm making are that if you're running a project much like if you're running a product then you need to kind of think about how are you actually seeking out getting people to, so you can bring them back in. And in the case of the product, like how are you gonna get people to turn around and wanna give you that money or give you those contributions? So I kind of, the way I've thought about this is kind of splitting this into like four sections, which is that you need to think about how you're gonna group the people who are involved with your project, your community, either as they are currently or where you want them to be in the future Think about kind of funneling people between those groups and like upselling people from one group that they're currently in into another one and then getting people to stick around. So let's go through and kind of think about these various things. So first, grouping people. So the most important question I think to ask yourself with anyone who's 
in your community or that you want to be there is why are they interacting with your project at all? Like what, what are they getting out of it? What is the benefit for them? Because for me, for example, as a homebrew maintainer who's been working on it for eight years, someone who uses homebrew to accomplish something in their day job, there's a different value proposition for me than there is for them. Like we have aligned interests, but those are not necessarily something which can be solved by taking the same approach to both of us. So I'm going to group these into three groups. I'm going to call users, contributors, and maintainers. So let's go through, th let's go through each group and how we think about them. So users, I'm saying, are basically anyone who uses the software, but specifically people who use the software who don't actually write any code. They don't write code. They don't triage issues for you. They're not on your GitHub project trying to like sort of help you run the project in whatever that, whatever that way may be. So they may be technical users. They may not be. But ultimately, what we're looking on from the project perspective is whether they're actually actively contributing yet. So these are a group of people who aren't doing that yet. You should always have at least one user, because hopefully the person who wrote the software is using the software, because otherwise it's probably not very useful. Secondly, are the contributors. So these are the people who are actively kind of submitting pull requests, if your project's on GitHub, to your project. But they're kind of not quite at the stage yet where everything they, can be, everything they do is just allowed to go in without review. They're not at the stage yet where they kind of know quite how the project works. They maybe don't quite get the scope of the project. That could be partly their fault or it could be partly yours. But they need that little bit of nudging. So as a result, in most projects, for the way I'm grouping people at least, I'm going to say contributors are the people who don't yet have commit access. They're the people who require at least one interaction from a maintainer in order to contribute code that actually makes it into the project. And then finally, the maintainers. Again, you're going to start the project with at least one of these people, because that's the person who initially created the project. And maybe that's you. Maybe if you're creating a project and you're the person in the room, like this is the group you're in today. But what we want to think about is like, how can we grow that group from just being one person to being more than one person? Because ultimately, not all maintainers will stay around forever. So let's have a we think about the funnel. So I'm going to make a few statements, which hopefully people may agree or disagree with. So the first one is, no one ever became a contributor without being a user first. I'm going to make this as a fairly blanket statement, because with the minor exceptions of maybe you're being told at your company that, oh, we need to submit a fix to X or whatever, and that's actually for some other team, and it's not for your team and whatever. Like Generally, people who are certainly working on open source in their spare time are doing it because they want to solve a problem they themselves have. And generally, if they want to solve a problem they themselves have, it's because they are already users of that software that they're experiencing that problem with. Like you may have heard the expression scratching your own itch. I think, personally, I feel like I don't hear that enough anymore around open source, because I think that's the biggest thing that gets people into open source. There's a lot of talk now about open source as a means of building reputation, or open source as like a corporate outreach type thing. But I think fundamentally, at the root of it, is you need to feel some degree of intrinsic motivation if you want to kind of go and get involved in another project like that. So similarly, no one ever became a maintainer without being a user. Um, sorry, that's a typo. That's meant to say no one ever became a maintainer without being a contributor. So similarly, people, Jess Rizal did a talk earlier today where, again, there's some rare cases where people join, say, a company that runs an open source project, and they haven't committed any code, and on day one they get given like, the keys to the castle. And she was saying, which I agree with, that that's generally a bad idea. You want to kind of have people, no matter where they are, no matter if they're employed by someone or you know them really well or they're a senior engineer or this, that, or the other, like, you want to make sure people are working through this funnel before they can just like, jump from one area to the other. So you want to have someone who's a repeated contributor who you have some degree of trust with before they become a maintainer. And then finally, no one can excel as a maintainer unless they remain as a user. Again, you see a problem with some open source projects that have been around for a while and are maybe understaffed that are kind of creaking under the load a little bit because they have loads of people who have become really interested in this project. But the original maintainer is not using it anymore. Maybe they wrote it for some problem they had at work that they don't have anymore. Maybe it's some Go library and at work they now write Node.js or whatever. And as a result, I think it's worth recognizing that in those situations, that person is going to be probably unable to be a really great maintainer anymore. And that's another reason why you want to find other ones so that they can 
maybe move on one day. So looking from, from the salesy, producty perspective again, um, apologies for my understanding of sales is relatively limited. So if there's salespeople in the room who I'm butchering the understanding of this, I apologize in advance. So my understanding is that you have kind of, when they talk about sales funnel, you have leads, prospects, and sales. So leads are people who like may be interested in your, in your product, like people who are maybe in the target market or whatever, but you don't know whether they're quite interested yet. Prospects are people who are interested, but they're yet to make a purchase. And then sales are people who have actually handed over or at least agreed to hand over money in exchange for your product or service. So again, obviously, as you can see from it being a triangle, there's going to be more leads than there is prospects than there is sales. Similarly, with the open source project, with the groups we were talking about, you're going to have more users than you're going to have contributors than you're going to have maintainers. So Homebrew is, if I do say so myself, a relatively successful open source project. We've had over 6,000 contributors. But based on our kind of analytics, which we've had in the last year or so, like it looks like we've had roughly about kind of a million-ish users. It's hard to predict because CI and all these type of things. And we intentionally make ourselves not very good at tracking unique users. Um, so Google Analytics says about 4 million. I reckon sort of half a million to a million sort of users. So when you look at 6,000 home group contributors, that's about 0.05% of our users are transformed into contributors. And again, like 6,000 unique contributors is good. Like that's impressive. So I would say that's worth, a lot of projects do a lot better than that. Um, Hoodie is an example of a project you may or may not have heard of that I've heard people describe as saying in Hoodie, almost every user is a contributor because they do such a good job of getting everyone involved. But just to set your expectations there, a lot of projects who may, not, who may have hundreds of users and are kind of like, why don't I have tens of maintainers? Like, yeah. The numbers we've seen reflect that that's not perhaps a realistic assumption. And in terms of our maintainers, so of 6,000 homebrew contributors, we've had, we have 17 current homebrew maintainers and about 25 in total over the kind of eight year lifetime of the project. Which again, when you look at our total users, that's 0.0015%. So the funnel drop off is pretty dramatic, but I think the key to like having that work at all, the key to having more than zero contributors and more than one maintainers is the next step we talked about, which is upsell. So again, another sales term that is possibly being like the metaphor is perhaps getting a little bit broken. But let's think about like why do people move between these groups and how do people move between these groups? So the first thing I would say is that most maintainers who end up maintaining open source projects were talked into it initially. I, I don't know on Homebrew or in many other projects, people who have proven themselves to be very good maintainers who, when they started off, were going, me, me, I really think I should be a maintainer. Like in almost every time, the people who proven to be very, very effective, the Homebrew maintainer who's the most active, who's in one of the most top 10 like, active users on GitHub, like we have a running joke that he's a bot because he competes with activity on things like, on a week to week basis with like Facebook's like, commit bot and stuff like that. So when, when we asked him to join the project, he, we had a bit of back and forth because he was like, no, I don't think I'm ready. Like, I don't know if I'm kind of good enough, whatever. But then he almost immediately proved that he was good enough and has added a tremendous amount of value to the project. But if we think about a project or an alternate homebrew future where we never ask that guy because we thought, well, you know, if he wants it, he'll ask for it then he would never have become a maintainer. And we would be missing out on, like, we would still probably be receiving contributions from that person, but we would be missing out from the shared sense of ownership and the help with the kind of burden of running the project from that person. So I'm going to show a few examples of how Homebrew does upselling. So the first thing is kind of even between, like, groups of users. So this is a random, like, at mention we got on our Twitter account. And again, this is not saying that this is a bad interaction or anything like that. So this is... I realize this has someone's name, and I, I'm not like saying anything about them. But like, this is an example of someone asking us a question on, on Twitter, which Twitter is not really the best communication method for resolving stuff like this. And we're trying to sort of push them and upsell them to go and create an issue. And this person may or may not, I have no idea. And certainly, we get cases where people do not like have a GitHub account already. They may not have filed issues with open source projects already. So we're trying to give them that gentle nudge of like, here's how to go and file an issue. And that is the best way of us like, interacting with you on this. 
And similarly, GitHub now has like issue templates and stuff like that that can make that process a little bit less daunting for first time uh, people filing an issue. So the next thing is again, like if we get issue reports that aren't very good, like it's quite common that it may not really be clear what the actual person's trying to do. They've described like an error message, but not like how you produce that error message or what they're trying to do. So this is like a little, I, I live my life around text expander macros, so I can type like, I think three characters and this gets expanded out. So like stuff like this is useful for just being like, okay, please like explain to me like what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, whatever. And um, as there's no GitHub people in the room, I don't think I can admit that I have used this on coworkers on occasion, this little template, when someone asks me to help with something and I, I don't really understand their question. So the next stage, which open source, how many people in here have heard the whole, I guess, pull requests welcome as like a kind of passive aggressive open source meme, like yeah, nodding heads, whatever. So I feel again, almost like the scratch your own itch thing like that. It's something that I feel needs to be sort of reclaimed because you can say pull request welcome in a way to shut down conversation when pull requests are not welcome. When it's like, you know, shut up and go away, submit a pull request. I don't think you're gonna do that. Therefore, I'm just gonna say that to you to make you go away. Or you can have it as being like, look, we're understaffed. We're not gonna work on this problem immediately. But if you submit a pull request, that actually may be the quickest way of you getting a solution to your problem. So again, another little text expanded macro I use is trying to upsell issue reports into pull requests. So this is common, particularly with issues that, you know, if there's something which is affecting like, I don't know, 50% of homebrew users, yeah, we're not gonna go and post stuff like this and then just sit and wait and leave it for someone else to do because that's important needs fixed now. If it's something that seems to affect one person and we're like, well, that's a legit bug, but like the priority is like way down here, then we try and again write like decent docs to like walk people through every stage of like, okay, here's how you can actually submit a pull request and like the stuff to do that will result in it being most likely to be merged. So with documentation like this, I guess the other thing we found that I would recommend in general is like Git and GitHub are like great. I like them both. I'm biased because one of them pays my bills. Um, but like they're still not widely really, really easy for everyone to use. So in these docs, I would encourage you to try and like have a little bit of an assumption as well that people may not know how to use Git. They may not know how to use GitHub and like give them guidance on like commands and pages on the site to go to and stuff like that. And like, you know, a, a coworker kind of put it in a nice way that, you know, how do I open source? How do I get, how do I GitHub? Those are all questions that you may want to help people with. How do I computer is maybe a step too far that like you might, you know, when your documentation gets to that point, it's maybe a lost cause. So then the next step we have is talking about upselling contributors into maintainers. So we have a little process here. The way that that actually ends up happening, again, I've been inspired by talks today to go and document the process that we follow to find new contributors, sorry, find new maintainers from contributors. Um, but we have this kind of, general process that we follow for doing that when we do find them, um, which is like, you know, send them a nice email, like try and highlight their contributions and make them feel good. And then like set the expectations of if you become a maintainer, like this is what you will have to do. This is what we would want you to do. This is what you shouldn't do, etc. So that they, they kind of know what they're signing up for. And again, a key point with that is because, you know, because projects like Homebrew are run exclusively by volunteers, like making sure maintainers understand that we're not asking you to sign up for a certain number of hours a week. Like the only thing I basically say to people is like, if you, if you merge something, I want you to be responsible for that change. If you merge something and then everything explodes, I want you to be sat at your computer trying to fix it. Like that's, and equally that's fine. And if you can't do that, then maybe merge it at like a different time that you might be around to fix things if they explode. Or alternatively, obviously, a better practice for almost, uh, almost all other projects would be actually to write tests so that things don't explode without you knowing. But hey, legacy code. Um, the next thing to think about is retaining people as well. You see a lot of projects where you get a lot of contributors or a lot of maintainers sign up, and then there's a flurry of activity and then people disappear. So there's a lot of talk about kind of 
leaky funnels in the tech industry in general. And I think this is another place that it's worth asking yourself, like, how leaky is this funnel? Like, are people trying to like go between these stages and they're just hitting things and like bouncing off? Um, because ultimately, there's no point in trying to add 20 maintainers to your project if they stick around for a month and then they bounce. Like, you're better to kind of figure out like adding a smaller number of people and then if they bounce, trying to like work with them to like figure out how could you have avoided that happening. So a few things I think that cause like the kind of leaky funnel stuff for each of the groups actually, because obviously again, if your users leak, then that's valid because you're gonna have less people who can go around and become contributors. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple of points for each of them. So for users, I think the three most important things I think from like homebrew perspective at least that I've learned are like the first that you maintain a high quality project. Again, there's a lot of stuff going around at the moment about like maybe on projects you should just, if anyone is enthusiastic about your project, you should just give them commit rights immediately, just merge their, all their patches like and don't basically don't be too pernickety, don't be too like picky about stuff. I kind of disagree with that a little bit because I think if Making your project very attractive to contributors in that way is kind of like in direct opposition to making your project very, very high quality for your users. And ultimately, if you drive all your users away because you merge every pull request without any review or conversation, then you're not going to have much of a project anymore. And that relates to the second one, which I personally have been guilty of doing, which is that someone puts a huge amount of time into something, a contributor, not necessarily a user, a contributor puts a huge amount of time into something and I kind of feel obligated at that point. Oh, I should probably merge this because like they're never going to really get this to like a great state, but like they're trying really hard. And like every time I've done that, I've turned around and ended up regretting it because that's not like a good reason to merge someone else's stuff is that you feel bad for leaving it too long or not being able to help them more or whatever. And that ties back to quality as well. And then the final thing I would say is, and this is a little bit contentious, what I mean by no v2.0 is you get a lot of open source projects that go and decide, you know, I guess like Homebrew, right? Homebrew's been around for a long time. We've got this kind of formula DSL for like how you install packages and stuff like that. And there's all this cruft and all these little bugs and edge cases and that. And it's very tempting as an engineer to go, you know what, like, I've got a really good understanding of the problem now. Let's throw away the way we did it before and let's make like, a new implementation and everything will be happy and perfect and whatever. The problem is when you do that, you introduce hella bugs and also you make it generally at that point pretty easy for someone to switch to another project. If you change everything in your project, then the switching cost to another similar competitor like, becomes often quite similar between going between homebrew V1 and Homebrew V2 as maybe going from Homebrew V1 to Mac ports. So you may well see that, particularly if your quality suffers at the same time, you bleed all your users to another project who ended up copying all the stuff that you did and ends up being a better V1.0 than your project was. On to contributors. So I think, again, lots of different projects do this in a different way. But I think a common misconception, I think, with open source projects is mistaking enthusiasm and sometimes even noise for the desire to work and the desire to be involved. So as a result, I think most of the stuff with contributors relates to how you communicate inside your project. So personally, I think like bike shedding in general, if people have, has anyone heard the expression bike shedding, familiar with what it means? So it's the idea that um, I like that someone like literally made almost like the emoji of like the, the hands like that. Um, it's the idea that if you ask people for review on your really technical like refactor of the back end in your app, like there'll be tumbleweed. Whereas if you ask people like, yeah, so like the office bike shed, we're thinking of painting it blue. What do people think about that? Like it's the barrier to entry in that conversation is so low that everyone will get involved and everyone will be like super into that conversation. So in open source projects, you can have similar things where if you propose like, hey, we're thinking of changing this to this, then like all your users, or certainly all of your users who kind of follow your project on GitHub can then get involved and be like, well, I think this and I think that and I think this and I think that. And actually that's not really helpful, particularly when you have maybe less experienced contributors or maintainers because you know 
they, they open some pull request and then they get 100 people jumping on them and being, oh, I don't think we should do this. So try and avoid bike shedding, try and keep technical discussions technical and try and keep them between the people who are gonna be responsible for maintaining them. Secondly, open discussions in general, I think it's good to have them, but like those should live in a different place to your technical discussions. On Homebrew, if someone opens an issue that's like, hey, like, you know, I'm kind of thinking this and wouldn't it be nice if this or whatever, like we kind of try and diplomatically close them and say, okay, we've got a mailing list or a forum or whatever, and that's a good place to have these sort of like discussions around Homebrew and avoid like clutching up our issue tracker with them. And then finally, R1, which is maybe a little bit controversial is that I don't personally really believe in feature request issues at all. When people submit a feature request issue, my triage process is am I or one of the other maintainers going to start work on this within a month or two? And if the answer is no, that issue gets closed almost immediately. And what that means is sometimes we end up missing stuff, but it also means that our issue tracker is not hundreds and hundreds of issues that we're like, it would be great to do that one day, but in reality, we're never going to. And also, when you have that, that can sometimes mask for contributors, like, look, this is a really good way to get stuck into these things, go and tackle one of these features, where in reality, none of the maintainers actually really want that feature, because if they did, they'd have done a better job than just leaving open like a random feature that a user had requested. And finally, with maintainers, the things I think are important are a code of conduct, like, again, you can debate about how structured that should or shouldn't be, like whether you need a code of conduct file in your repo or whatever. But I think in general, the expectation that people on your project, both users and contributors and maintainers, like treat each other well and with respect, I think is really important. Like I have a reputation sometimes in our project and in our team at work as being like a bit of a hard ass on this stuff because like when I'm working on Homebrew in my spare time and someone who is using Homebrew to accomplish their day job, is getting like snippy at me at like 11 p.m. on a Friday evening, then it's a little bit like, well, you're not really motivating me to help you, dude. Like, and I think having that expectation that it, it's acceptable for maintainers to push back a little bit and say, you know, this is my free time. I'm gonna try and help, but please try and be nice and appreciative about it. Like, I think that's something that helps people not burn out. Another thing related to that, I think personally, which is a little bit controversial perhaps, is having a private space for maintainers to be able to discuss stuff. Um, I know there's been various sources that say in open source, all the discussions should be completely in the open. But I feel that's kind of like saying in your company, if you imagine all your company's conversations were in the open for all your shareholders to view every single conversation you ever have. Like that's not really fostering like a an environment of like vulnerability, an environment where people can be like really honest about how they feel if you know that like literally the entire world is watching. So I think that private chat is often useful in resolving conflicts. There's been quite often times where I've seen a little bit of a disagreement happening on a PR and then people then pull that into Slack and then resolve it like synchronously. And then of course the important thing is then bring back the conclusion of that conversation and then post that on the PR. But I don't think like airing dirty laundry needs to happen in public. And personally, I don't think that's the healthiest way to do so. And then finally, your maintainers should always be growing. As I mentioned before, there's lots of ways that maintainers may decide to step down from the project if they're not using it anymore, if they don't have time anymore, if, if it's not fun for them anymore, basically. And as a result, like trying to always be getting more maintainers into your project and more contributors to become maintainers is the best way of ensuring that your maintainers can step away when they want to. So these are the four things that we were thinking about. So grouping your users into categories. So that was like your users, your contributors, and your maintainers. Funneling them between them, like thinking about there's going to be a decline in each of those groups. Don't beat yourself up when you're not having a really large number of your users becoming contributors, or if you're not having a large number of your contributors who are willing to maintain your project. Upsell them. So whenever you get the chance, try and find ways like processes that you encourage all of your maintainers to follow to try and nudge people who seem like they could be enthusiastic or are working hard to be able to empower them to solve their own problems rather than needing you to do them all for them. And then finally focus on the things that are important to retain the people on your project who you need to sustain your project. And then hopefully if everything goes well and you all have taken some useful stuff from this talk and if anything I've said is actually correct, then next year, you can have these problems 
where you're saying everyone's contributing to my project, and now I have problems too. And then I can do another talk about that, and we can all deal with that in group therapy. Right, so thank you very much, everyone. And if everyone has any questions, and feel free if you had private questions to either grab me afterwards or I'm at Mike McQuaid on the Twitter. Thanks. So the question was, I'll repeat them just to make sure everyone can hear. Uh, GitHub has, when you file an issue, you can basically add a markdown file which basically pre-populates the issue with like a little, I guess, just plain text form that people could kind of fill out. And do you find that people use that or do you find that people kind of just ignore it? So most of the time, I do actually find that people do use that and they do like follow the steps that are requested of them. I suspect, although I have no evidence for this, that sometimes in like Homebrew's case, like us telling them to go through those steps sometimes solves their problem and stops them from filing the issue. But of course, like, like anything, like people don't read. So you will get people who either just delete the whole thing and don't fill it in, or people who tick the boxes and then like they've obviously lied about ticking the boxes. Like, yeah, so you're always gonna get those type of problems, but I think Again, with our kind of trying to prioritize maintainers not burning out, like we've added a thing to that issue template, like in the middle that's relatively prominent to says, if you don't fill this in, we may just close your issue without any comment or explanation or whatever. So again, I feel like a little bit harsh when I do that, but I've got in the habit of doing that because often if, if someone can't show the respect for the people who've taken the time to write that documentation to at least try and read like something which will take them 30 seconds, then there's, there's basically a the misbalance there from the outset. So I think at that point, it's reasonable for you to say, no, like we're, you know. And again, that person can always then file another issue or amend their issue to add the information that was requested of them. Thanks, good question. Yep, good question. So the question was, um, with my policy of kind of closing feature issues immediately, do, do we have a suggestion of a better way of tracking uh, like enhancement requests from the community and from maintainers as well? So I, we tried for a while, like the Swift project has a good process, like they have a Swift evolution repository where you basically submit, I guess kind of like Python Python is, what's PEP stand for? Python Enhancement Proposal or something? Yeah. Um, where basically you submit effectively kind of like a semi-serious document, not like a two-line whatever, like specking out what you think should be a feature that is there and describing like what that looks like and how it should be implemented and alternatives you considered and stuff like that. So I think that's a process that, that works quite well because it requires a little bit more involvement and effort from the person to kind of really think through the problem a little bit. We bailed on that process because it ended up being that no one except for me would ever implement any of those proposals anyway. So it's like, in some ways, it just felt kind of cruel putting people through a much longer process only to have the same end result, where I would kind of rather that people go and submit a feature issue and I close it and then, again, so something that I omitted there is like, I close stuff and then we'll reopen it. So if, I, if someone submits a feature and it's like, hey, I think we should do this, and then over the course of the next week, I get another 15 people who all come out on that issue saying, I noticed this was closed, but I would really love this, then yeah, like I'll change my mind and reopen it and maybe implement it. But it's just, I guess, setting the expectation on, on people that these issues that sit open for years and years and years, like chances are, if no one's implemented it within a, a few months, probably never gonna happen. Like, but, yeah, I mean, different projects do that in different ways. And I think it depends on how many people you have actually actively working on those types of features. But thanks. In your earlier uh, comments about contributors as users coming down the phone from contributors, I think part of that might be affected by how hard or easy or complex the software itself is. 
Yep. Yeah, that was a, a great point. Basically, that if you have a more technical product, a project, then you're going to have more technical users who are more likely to be contributors anyway. And I think yeah, Homebrew is a developer tool, so like not everyone who uses it is a developer, but I feel like a, the line share are. Uh, but even then, I guess it's something I didn't mention. But it's thinking about ways that you can just lower the barrier to entry. Like one way is having all your you know, documentation live in your repo, for example, so people can submit pull requests to it. For us, like a cool thing that a bunch of people have done is like translated our website into like, you know, 30 languages or something. And people will just submit a random PR and like add some new language I didn't know existed. And yeah, like, and that doesn't require them like knowing or writing any code. It does require a certain degree of kind of technical understanding of submitting a PR, but you can do all that through the GitHub web UI at least today. But so an example of a command we added relatively recently, which is like in Homebrew, when you submit, we basically get the community to submit kind of, you know, if there's a new version of a piece of software, like we have some automated stuff to kind of detect that, but then it's quite often the community who submits that update. So we had, you know, documented more and more stuff and tried to make it easier for people to do. And then eventually we actually have a, a script you can run that is bundled with Homebrew itself that you can literally provide the name of the package and like the new version and the checksum, and it will like create a PR for you. Um, I was just trying to like get people to, I guess, understand that it's like we're, it's really, really easy for you to do this stuff, and it, we want to make it as easy as possible. And there may be stuff that gets more complicated than that, but for the simple like 90% case, like let's try and provide as much tooling as possible to like get you as far as you can. Uh, do you mean like CLAs and yeah. stuff? Yeah. So the question was about contributor agreements and when they do and don't make sense for a project. Uh, my understanding of CLAs, and I'm very much not a lawyer, is that they are useful if you want to do stuff like change the license in the future because you have the code is not all owned and licensed by each individual person who contributes to your project, but is like they basically sign away their like they sign away their rights to the project to be able to like relicense their contributions and stuff in the future. That's not, I guess, it's something where with something like Homebrew, it would have been cool maybe to do that like in the early days, but like doing that stuff after the fact and chasing up everyone who's ever contributed is like nigh and impossible at this point. So it's not something I have strong feelings on. I guess it's something that I do feel is a little bit potentially process that can put off and annoy people a little bit if it's like I think the GitHub CEO expressed one time about him like literally mailing paper to contribute to a particular open source project in the past and it's like yeah that at that point you're going to just stop people from wanting to contribute but yeah I don't have strong feelings either way thanks very much everyone and I'll hang around for a bit if anyone wants to chat thank you